Good morning, everyone. I invite you to turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. We've been in this book since the start of the year, and it's amazing how something that's nearly 3,000 years old has something to say for our lives each and every week when we open the text. My name's Hugh, and I'm one of the pastors here. For those that know me, you're going to be astonished by this opening admission. I was really awkward as a kid. (laughs) I know it's hard to believe. I was very shy. I had this life motto, do not speak unless spoken to, and maybe not even then. When I tell my kids stories about middle school days and high school days, it produces one of two responses. The first response is typically laughter. Dad, you are such a dork. The other response is compassion and pity. Dad, you are such a dork. (laughs) One of the challenges that I had, one of the contributing factors to my awkwardness is that I lacked the coordination required to chew gum and walk at the same time. And it was about 10th grade that some of those things started to come together for me. Now, I had put in a lot of time playing driveway basketball, shooting with three, two, while the crowd goes wild. I had done that over and over, but I was really terrible. Until about 10th grade, it started to come together for me. But 10th grade is a little bit late to break in. I had this really short window of opportunity. Should I go for it? Now's the chance to go for it. But I was so scared of not making the team, I didn't even try out. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us your word. Would you be so kind as to remind us yet again this morning that you are wise and loving and good. You're a good father. Speak to us, your children, this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. This morning, we're going to see Solomon's guide to stewarding your life. Solomon's guide to stewarding your life, point one. Be wise, but take a risk. We read chapter 11, verse 1. Send your bread on the surface of the water, for after many days you may find it. Now, I probably don't even need to make any commentary here because the verse is so abundantly clear. What a bizarre opening verse, right? Hey, you want some bread? Just take the bread that you have and toss it out on the water and you'll get some more. Hey, Holly, do we have any bread? Oh, yeah, I threw some out on the water days ago. We should have more any time now. Rather than talking about actual bread, most commentators say that Solomon is referring to an investment, a shipping venture to send grain to some foreign land. You invest a little bread now in the hopes of getting more bread back when the ship returns with its profits. You might hear someone say, uh, he is the main breadwinner for the family, or she's working really hard because she's trying to get that bread. Solomon's calling for people to take a risk. Be willing to try something. And we know that all investment involves some kind of risk. You put money in in hopes of getting a return, but it doesn't always go that way. In the last 15 years or so, shifting markets has led to people losing a lot of money, money that they set aside. We read on in verse 2, Solomon's going to give a prudent approach to this investment. He says, give a portion to seven or even to eight, for you don't know what disaster may happen on earth. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. This is your financial advisor saying you need to diversify your investments. And it makes sense. It would be a very risky venture to put 100% of your investment into one single ship because one storm could take that ship and all of your investment to the bottom of the ocean. 
Storms rage. We never know what's going to happen. So divide your investment into seven or even eight. Verse three, if the clouds are full, they will pour out rain on the earth. Whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. Sometimes disaster strikes and it comes with a clear sign. If you walk out your front door and you see dark, angry clouds, you know you got to go back in and get an umbrella. You got to get a rain jacket. You've got to change your plans in some way because the clear sign is given to you that action is needed. Other times, there is no warning. Like a tree falling for the indoor enthusiasts in the room, if you were to find yourself out in a forest, you're going to see that trees have fallen and they don't fall in an orderly fashion. They fall all over the place. The wind pushes this one this way. Gravity calls another tree to fall this way. And there's no warning. We don't know when it's going to happen. You're not going to ever get turned away at Paris Mountain State Park because there's a scheduled tree falling that day. Trees just fall and we can't do anything about it. And sometimes... These actions are significant. They're not reversible. He says the tree falls, and where it falls, that's where it's going to lie. We start with be wise, but take a risk. The second point in Solomon's guide to stewarding your life, don't put it off. He starts with a financial image in verses 4 to 6. He moves to an agricultural image. He says, one who watches the wind will not sow and the one who looks at the clouds will not reap just as you don't know the path of the wind or how bones develop in the womb of a pregnant woman so you also don't know the work of god who makes everything in the morning sow your seed and at evening do not let your hand rest because you don't know which will succeed whether one or the other, or if both of them will be equally good. There are some optimal conditions for sowing seed. You want little to no wind. You want even distribution of your sin if there's uh, uh, of the of your seed. If you want to see your seed lost, then go out and scatter seed in a big windstorm. You need to harvest your vegetables, your crop. In sunny, dry conditions, if you bring it in when it's wet, you risk losing it to mildew and mold. It's best to sow seed and harvest at the right times. What Solomon's doing here is he's provoking his readers to take action, to live lives of action. He's describing someone that's been gripped by fear. They're anxious about losing what they have. They don't want to be wasteful. They don't want to lose what they have. They're concerned with things being so perfect that they don't even get started. I'm, I'm not going to scatter this seed until the wind has totally died down. Or I'm not even going to think about harvesting the crop until we've had several days of, of dry, rainless weather, 80 degrees or better. Otherwise, I'm just not going to do it. I don't want to lose what I have. Solomon's point is that you're never going to have perfect conditions that watching the wind and the clouds is going to lead to never even starting. Verse 6, you don't know when you're going to find success. Maybe it's sowing in the morning. Maybe it's sowing in the evening. What's really interesting is sowing seed is an act of faith for the farmer. He could eat that seed and have a little bit of nourishment for a short time, but he puts it in the ground in the hopes that something more is going to come. But sometimes seed just doesn't take. Now Solomon says something four times in these opening six verses. He says, you don't know. Verse two, you don't know when disasters may come. 
Verse 5, you don't know the path of the wind or how babies are formed. Verse 5, you don't know the work of God. Verse 6, you don't know which sowing of the seed will bear fruit. So there's three clear things that we can take from this. We don't know how to predict the future. Disasters are always the stuff of documentaries. It was a couple years ago, my family, we were watching this documentary about a New Zealand island volcano. Maybe some of you perhaps have seen it. It's it's not a big island, but essentially the whole thing is a volcano. And there's several dozen people that have taken the long ferry ride from the mainland over to the island. They want to view this crater. They get up top. They look down inside when unexpectedly the volcano erupts. And it wasn't um, a volcano with, with lava coming out, but there was a gigantic cloud of really hot ash thrown into the air and it it took the lives of several people and those that were farther out they survived and they suffered terrible burns and all of them in being interviewed they're saying the same kind of things why this day why this time why when we were there if only there was something we could have done if only there was a way that we could have known of course, we all understand conceptually that, that we don't know the future. And yet, we don't live that way. We've made lunch plans today. We have our weeks scheduled out. We push those plans out weeks and months and even years. And it's right and good for us to do that. But do we ever have it at the back of our mind that those events may never happen? Would realizing it have any difference about how you go about your days. Not only do we not know the future, we also don't know that which only God can do. Engineers may build wind farms, but we don't know how to control or see the path of the wind. We might have the ability to have a 3D image of a baby in the womb. But we don't know how God divides cells so that some become ears and some become eyes. How some cells become liver and others become leg. There are lots of ways that we work. There's lots of things that we can do, but there are some things that only God can do. We're limited in countless ways, but God is without limit. In our limited mind, it's even difficult for us to comprehend what that means. Stephen Curtis Chapman sang a simple and yet profound song when he said, God is God and I am not. There's a lot there. One author this week I read said, living under the sun, believers are happy to take comfort in knowing that they do not know. We learn, perhaps through great pain, to be deeply content with not knowing. To know all there is to know about everything to know, and to know it in all the ways and at all the right times, so that I have every bit of relevant data in front of me, well, that's the kind of control over the world that Ecclesiastes has been teaching me to surrender. I cannot know, so I don't have to know. Trying to know or pretending to know is foolishness, not wisdom. There's a lot of freedom for us to admit our, limit, our limitations. Say we don't know. We also don't know how to guarantee success or how to avoid failure. Being successful is a universal aim in life from our earliest days. We want to win the t-ball game. We want to sell the most Girl Scout cookies. We want the best grades. We want to succeed in business. We aim to prosper. We aim to avoid failure. And we tend to think that failing is the worst thing that can happen to us. Getting fired, failing a test, being publicly embarrassed, and we connect these things to our lives. A lost job is a lost life. A failed test is a failed life. A 
An investment down the drain is a life down the drain. But the wise person knows that their identity is not bound to a single event. Looming disasters, imperfect conditions, incomplete knowledge, these are all factors that produce fear and anxiety in us. They become like boat anchors to keep us from moving. So Solomon's larger point is there's something more important than succeeding and there's something more tragic than failing. What he's pushing us to do, to take risks, to embrace the fact that we don't know how things are going to go, he's showing us that, that what's worse than success or failure is failing to live today. This is basically the same sermon that Brandon preached last week. We have got to live today. So what do we do with this? How do, what do, we, how do we grapple with the fact that we don't know all these things? First, we have to recognize that a lack of guaranteed success is not an excuse for inactivity. A lack of perfect conditions is not an excuse. Lack of knowledge is not an excuse. Wringing our hands over a possible disaster is not an excuse. We can let these things that are totally out of our control totally paralyze us. And I think that serious minded Christians are actually really susceptible to uh, paralysis in decision making. We want to make the right decision. We want to do what God is calling us to do. We think about it like a bullseye. And where do we want to be? We want to be in the center of God's will. And so we're fearful of missteps. We're fearful of getting one of these second or third best options. We don't want to mess up. And so often this leads to not doing anything. Now, this could be a sermon all of its own, so let me cut to the chase here. God is not hiding his will from you. God has given us his word, his son, his spirit, and he's made us members of a family, all with the efforts of God saying, this is who I am and this is how I want you to live. He's not trying to trick you. He's shown us exactly what he's like in putting forward his son. And this son, who is the exact imprint of the father, he says what we need to be chiefly concerned with above all other things is loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So what what would your decisions look like? What would your decision-making process look like if your chief concern was loving Jesus with all of your heart? What if you were more obsessed with loving God rather than what person you should date? What if you were more fixated on loving Jesus and deciding if you should be a professor or a plumber? There are some decisions that we just don't need to overthink because God has spoken. And there are lots of decisions that do not need to sink us because God has given us wisdom, he's given us his spirit, and he's put us, again, he's put us in a family that's got wisdom. So many trusted counselors. And then there's just a whole variety of decisions that we are just free to do something. God gives us freedom. Augustine said, love God and do whatever you please. For the soul trained in love to God will do nothing to offend the one who is beloved. Make it your obsession, your fixation to love Jesus. Second, we recognize that life is today. I won't go long here because Brandon taught so well on this last week. We tend to think that life is just around the corner or just out of reach. Once I get to that next rung on the ladder, then life's really going to begin. That, that new job or that relationship that I've been longing for, we're, we're waiting for life to start and we're like in the on deck circle ready for our time to shine. Life is 
today. We have to remember that we don't need to look ahead or look back, but life is today. Third, we recognize that we cannot delay following God's commands. We need to be honest and call it what it is. If, if I say I'm going to follow God later, it's the same thing as saying I am not going to follow God. Don't deceive yourself into thinking that delayed obedience is just some type of obedience. It's not. Perhaps the Spirit of God has been convicting you to put something off. What you're watching, the way you're spending your money, some relationship that is not an encouragement to your walk with Christ. If God's Spirit has been working on you, then you, you know what it is. He, right now, the Spirit's putting the yellow highlighter on that thing. Don't delay. Today is the day to follow His commands. Maybe God's Spirit is compelling you to begin something new. There's some area of your life that's out of sorts, and you need to remedy that, to take action here. Whatever and however God's Word and God's Spirit are leading you, do so today. Commit to obeying Him today. And don't wait for some preconceived idea of perfect conditions in order to do this. Don't settle for, I'll get around to it. Years will go by. You'll be looking at the wind and watching the clouds, and there will be nothing to show for it. In God's kindness, this text was heavy on me this week in preparation. I think back so many times, so many areas of my life that I knew the right thing to do and I did not do it and I had all the best intentions in loving my God and loving my wife and loving my children I wasn't sure if I was going to share this story because I'm it's funny but it's not it's tragic um, well our, when our firstborn uh, came and she turned 10, I said, just you and dad are going to go on a 10 venture. We're going to go out and have fun. And I think maybe by the time she was 11 or 12, we got around to the 10 venture. We went backpacking together and it was great. And my 14 year old is still waiting on her 10 venture. And I've had really good intentions Birthday gifts and Christmas gifts of giving camping equipment and backpacks. I've had good intentions. And now I'm saying to a whole room to hold me accountable. She better not turn 15 in August without having her 10 venture. <laughs> Don't wait. Don't watch the wind. Don't watch the clouds. To non-Christians in the room, the prophet Isaiah said, Today is the day of salvation. And the psalmist says, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. So do you hear the Lord's voice? Is he pressing on you? Do you sense the Spirit saying you're a sinner in need of forgiveness? Don't harden your heart. Look to Jesus and live. Turn from your sin. Trust in Christ. Today is the day of salvation. Solomon's Guide to Steward in Your Life. Be prudent, but take a risk. Don't put it off. And third, strike while the iron is hot. Re read verses 7 through 10. Light is sweet, and it is pleasing for the eyes to see the sun. Indeed, if someone lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. And let him remember the days of darkness, since they will be many. All that comes is futile. Rejoice, young person, while you are young. And let your heart be glad in the days of your youth. And walk in the ways of your heart and in the desires of your eyes. But know that for all these things, God will bring you to judgment. Remove sorrow from your heart and put away pain from your flesh. Because youth and the prime of life are fleeting. Verses 7 and 8, this light, it represents good. 
blessing, joy, rejoice in the good days. There's, this is, again, much of what Brandon taught us last week. Live today. Enjoy today. If God gives you a lot of years, then rejoice in them all. But what we have to note is how temporary life under the sun is. That's why I made this point, strike while the iron is hot. If a blacksmith wants to work with iron, it is rigid. It is inflexible. In order to work that material, he's got to put it in a furnace and get it red hot. And while it's red hot, it's under the conditions by which that that iron can be worked and shaped. But once it gets cool, it has to be heated up again. It's temporary. Verse 9 gives us the counsel, the strange counsel. Walk in the ways of your heart and desire of your eyes. This is a cultural mantra if ever there was one. Do what you want. Whatever makes you happy, go for it. People call this expressive individualism, where the highest aim should be authentic living and self-expression. Former Apple CEO Steve Jobs said, there's no reason not to follow your heart. All this is very fitting for cultural commentary, but it is out of sorts in terms of biblical wisdom. And some of you are probably already raising objections to this. How is this not an endorsement of sinful hedonism? Our first parents fulfilled the desire of their eyes and they brought ruin into the world. Genesis 3, 6, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. The book of Judges is this sevenfold cycle of tragedy where God's people rebel. They fall into idolatry. Then God brings judgment in the form of a foreign army to take them over. Then he raises up a deliverer to bring them out of that judgment and they repent. And on and on the cycle goes. And this madness is summed up. In those days, there was no king in Israel Everyone did whatever seemed right to him. Jeremiah describes the heart. The heart is more deceitful than anything else, incurable. Who can understand it? Jesus continues this idea in Matthew 15. What comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and this defiles a person. For from the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual immoralities, Thefts, false testimonies, slander. Proverbs 28 sums it up. The one who trusts in himself is a fool. Christianity teaches that our fundamental problem is not first out here in the world. It's here in us. And the only way of solution, salvation, can never come from within. It's got to come from outside of us. We need a deliverer. The consistent counsel of Scripture is that it is folly to follow your heart. It's always folly to follow your heart. So the key to understanding this verse is noting how it ends. I'll read verse 9 again. Rejoice, young person, while you're young, and let your heart be glad in the days of your youth, and walk in the ways of your heart and in the desire of your eyes, but know that for all these things, God will bring you to judgment. Everyone will give an account of their lives. A time of judgment awaits each of us, and God himself will be the judge. It's not blind lady justice. It's not a mathematical formula that counts the good things we've done versus the bad. It's the all-knowing ever-living God who knows all and sees all, who will weigh our lives. This is another evidence of why life under the sun matters to us, because what we do matters to God. It reminds us again that God is just, that he'll not be mocked, he'll not be fooled. And what's amazing is that the verse 
commends us to go for joy. What your eyes see, what your heart wants, go for it. Be fulfilled, but know that you also need to be prepared for judgment. In other words, God is not this cosmic killjoy that's trying to keep us away from pleasure. He wants us to have full pleasure, full enjoyment, and also do so in a godly way. Solomon addresses the young person in verse 9, so I want to do the same thing. Every child in the room, give me your attention, especially dialed in for the next couple of moments. Proverbs 22 says that foolishness is bound to your heart. One of the especially deep roots of foolishness in our hearts is is so difficult to remove that it's common to see this bloom and blossom well past youth. This foolish root says that it is impossible to be truly satisfied and have joy while obeying God's commands. This foolish root says, if you want to really have a good time and really be happy, you've got to do whatever you want to do and go against all the rules. When in reality, the people that get everything they want, they're the most miserable people. The pleasure of sin is only a passing sin. It does not last. It cannot last. So this passage shows us that God's heart is for, for us is to be full of joy and to rejoice in this life he's given us and to be prepared for judgment. In other words, real lasting joy and godliness are not at odds. They're best friends. They go together. Verse 10, remove sorrow from your heart. Put pain away from your flesh because youth and the prime of life are fleeting. How do we remove sorrow from our heart? It begins with an honest self-assessment and admission that we don't know the future. We don't know the hidden works of God. We don't know how to guarantee success. The days are fleeting. So we've got to live for something that lasts. In closing, I want to give us three ways to, to steward our life. First, steward your life for loving Jesus. Steward your life for loving Jesus. John said the only reason that we love God is that that he loved us first. I think the more aware we are of how greatly we are loved by Christ, the more capacity we have for loving him. In Luke chapter 7, we have a scene that's, that's well known. Jesus gets invited into a Pharisee's home. And he's sitting there at the meal, and this notorious known sinner, she crashes the party. She sits at Jesus' feet, and she is weeping. She washes his feet with her tears. She dries them with her hair. She anoints his feet with expensive perfume. And the host, he's thinking to himself, prophet, Yes, yeah, some prophet. If he, if he knew who was at his feet, he would not stand for this. Jesus then responds to this man's thoughts. Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, say it, teacher. A creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one he forgave more. You have judged correctly, he told them. He told him. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she, with her tears, has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. This morning, our passage in Ecclesiastes, it concludes with a warning of coming judgment. 
The gospel tells us that before Christ came to bring judgment, he came to bear our judgment. God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Church, let it be your aim to love Jesus because he's loved you and forgiven you so much. If you want to grow in your love for him, pursue him. Remember what he's done. Enjoy Jesus. Secondly, steward your life for relationships. God has made us for relationships. We're at our best when we're together, and this is where the local church is a huge gift to us. God has given us the church to have a community of like-minded people, all who have been called out from the world and called to Christ. The church is the best friend to those who need help. The church is the biggest support to those in process. So who knows you? Who knows how to encourage you? Who knows how to challenge you? You need to be close, pressed into the life of the church. The easy on-ramp here is if you're saying, I I need that, is find a small group. Be the best, most committed member of that small group that you can be. Be ready to disciple someone younger than you. Or maybe you're saying, I need to be discipled. I need one-on-one investment. If, If you want to be in a group, if you want to be discipled or disciple someone else, Find me after the service. Email any one of the pastors. We would be delighted to help you with that. Thirdly, steward your life for mission. Solomon said, we don't know the works of God. We don't know the path of the wind. We don't know how a baby is formed in the womb. Evangelism is the ultimate example here. We have no idea how this works other than God says, That faith comes by hearing. That's Romans 10. Romans 1, the gospel is the power of God to save. 2 Corinthians 4, unbelievers have been blinded to see, to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. But then sometimes when the word is spoken, the God who said, let there be light, he causes the light to shine so that we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And that's something that we just don't understand. And so we make it our aim to speak of Christ. We can have good intentions. We can wait for the right conditions to be just perfect. We can wait for, I want my relationship with this person to be at this certain level before I go there. I don't want it to be awkward. We're watching the wind. We're watching the clouds. Let's be prudent and just take a risk. Give it a shot. Tell someone what Jesus has done for you. Talk about Christ. Befriend unbelievers. Go on a mission trip. Go to the meeting today. The scripture calls us to be wise, but take risks. The scripture calls us not to put off action. Today is the day of salvation. Obey God. Do what he's leading you to do. And strike while the iron is hot. Days under the sun are temporary, so make the most of them and enjoy God. We're going to have a time of reflection. Consider, how are you stewarding today? Are you really living or are you on hold? What's held you up? What's causing you to wait? What's preventing you from following through with what God is calling you to do? Have some time of quiet reflection and I'll close this out in prayer in just a moment. This morning we recognize that we are imperfect stewards. 
And so we, we fall on your grace. We pray for your, your help to live lives that are worthy of the gospel. We thank you that we, we stand before you secure because of what Christ has done for us. We want to respond to his great love by, by managing, stewarding our days well. We want to make the most of them. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Pastor Matt's now going to come and lead us in the supper. I'll go ahead and invite the servers.